Okay, so good day, everybody, and I'm happy to welcome you to the ICTP FAC Condensed Matter Physics Seminar um, today. Today, we'll be having uh, Professor Julia Gali from the University of Chicago. She will be talking to us um, today about something very important. So I'll tell you, give you a few words about Julia. So Julia Gali is the new family professor of electronic structure and simulation in the Prisca School of Molecular Engineering and in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Chicago. She's also a senior scientist at the Agro National Lab, um, where she's the director of the MECOM. And Julia has a lot of um, accomplishments. She's a member of the National Academy of Science, CIS, the American Academy of Arts and Science, and the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science. She's also a fellow of the American Physical Society, um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, she has won a lot of awards, including the Theory Award from the Materials Research Society, MRS, the David Adler Award in Materials Physics, and the Anesu Raman Prize for Computational Physics from the APS. She also won the Feynman Nanotechnology Prize in Theory, the Medal of the Scholar Physica Romana, and the Tomasoni Kisesi Award from La Sapienza University in Italy. So Julia is an expert in the development of theoretical and computational methods to predict and engineer material and molecular properties from quantum simulations. So today she'll be talking to us exactly about quantum simulations of materials for sustainable generation, for sustainable energy generation and energy use. So Julia, um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for inviting me here today. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to give this talk. And I uh, will tell you some of our efforts in understanding materials that uh, may be useful to uh, generate devices for uh, to build devices for sustainable energy generation and use. And uh, I thought that, that I would just show you a picture justifying why, of course, uh, uh, sustainable energy generation and use is, uh, uh, you know, a pressing problem today. And I don't think that this problem in general needs uh, any uh, introduction. And of course, it's not only a problem of science, uh, it's a problem of uh, policy, but uh, this is not the topic of our uh, talk today. Um, so uh, we uh, look at uh, uh, complex materials and processes in materials. Uh, and uh, these are some uh, examples of the question that we try to address. For example, can we design easy to make and cheap solar cells using colloidal quantum dots? And why would you want to do that? Because if you were able to do that, these are solar cells, these would be solar cells that are quite uh, simple to prepare and they don't need uh, uh, you know very complex synthetic methods or another question is how do we trigger desire photoreaction to generate clean fuel for example hydrogen at the interface of photoabsorber catalyst and water other problems that we are interested in is uh, um, uh, low power uh, uh, electronics for uh, you know uh, uh, sustainable energy use, and uh, these are other uh, an example of two other questions uh, that we are looking at uh, at present. How do we design efficient all organic light emitting diets, and which materials are sustainable for energy efficient neuromorphic platforms and low power electronics? So, if you uh, you know look at uh, these uh, problems and uh, what do they have in common? from a microscopic fundamental point of view. What they have in common is that uh, we need to study materials that are really heterogeneous systems. We need to understand interfaces, defects, and complex building block. And uh, in the questions that I've uh, uh, tried to highlight, uh, we are uh, often worrying about interaction of matter and light in matter and external fields. And in a recent perspective that we have written with uh, my colleague Sharon Hamif Schiffer, we have tried to highlight, and I'll get back to that at the end, the importance really 
of uh, coupling theory, data, simulation, and experiment. These are very difficult problems. And without an integration with experiment at each step of the way, it will be very difficult to make uh, any progress. Uh, today I will uh, uh, focus on two uh, of the questions that uh, uh, I just uh, summarized, uh, and uh, especially at, uh, I will focus my attention on some oxide materials that are involved both in photo absorbers in, for water splitting and uh, uh, in neuromorphic platform. So I will tell you something about our theoretical and computational strategies without much uh, uh, details, but just to give you an idea of uh, how we set up our investigation. Then I will talk about uh, energy conversion, solar to fuel, and low power electronic, and uh, about a neuromorphic architecture. That would be a shorter part of the talk. And, uh, uh, and I will uh, give you some concluding remarks, also trying to uh, uh, go into uh, hopefully a discussion and, uh, and questions after the talk. OK, so uh, when we start uh, to look at one of the problems that I uh, just mentioned, uh, the very first question that we ask is, what is a structural model that we can use to study the system? at the microscopic level. And we derive structural model for any of the problems that I mentioned with the aid of density functional and first principle uh, molecular dynamics. And uh, uh, we do first principle molecular dynamics, of course, pioneered uh, and invented many years ago by uh, Karen Parinello. And uh, every time you do first principle molecular dynamics or any time you do any density functional theory calculation, you should ask yourself which density functional theory, right? Which functional? And I will just briefly mention here and there which functional we use. But for the students in the audience, this question is very important. And you can get very different results <laughs> depending on the functional that you use. And the other thing that I would mention is that uh, very recently, uh, teaming up with uh, Michele Ceriotti at the EPFL, uh, we also did some calculation coupling first principle molecular dynamics with the path integral and specifically with the quantum thermostat that uh, Ceriotti pioneered to look at the specific electron phonon interaction and quantum vibronic coupling for some light system like carbon based system. Okay, so. Uh, Every time you do a, a, a simulation and you want to derive a structural model, the first question that you ask is, how can we validate our structural models? And let me give you two examples of uh, the kind of complex validation procedures that we have been uh, setting up for some of the system that we are studying. And one is for oxide water interfaces uh, using X-ray reflectivity data. So this is work that we have done over the years with the Paul Fenters group at Argonne National Lab, where we picked a specific surface. Actually, this uh, was supposed to be a simple interface, uh, alumina, aluminum oxide and water interface, uh, before going to more complex additional metal oxide. But in itself, it turned out to be quite complex. And we set up a model, and they, you know, we knew the surface termination that they had experimentally. And they did the experiment. And the, the question was, if we look at the X-ray reflectivity, which comes from the interface, supposedly, do we have something which is in agreement with the experiment telling us that we are doing a good job? And this is a, a, what we got for the X-ray reflectivity. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the two curves here represent two different functionals. So you see, we have a good qualitative agreement. We get uh, the main peaks. And uh, here, the region here where there is some disagreement is a region of very low density. But the quantitative uh, agreement is not perfect. And you have to keep it in mind when you interpret your results. And it's not the same for different functionals. Um, there is no one size fits all when uh, it comes to uh, actually uh, validation. And this is another completely different validation procedure that we set up, for example, 
to look at what happens in an a ensemble of nanoparticles, building blocks that we wanted to look at for uh, solar cells, uh, a colloidal solar cells application. And the picture here on the right tells you, you know, the building blocks are actually immersed in an inorganic uh, matrix in what is the structure of this matrix. So here we did several first principle molecular dynamic simulation to just identify structural motives. And then of these structural motives, uh, we identified the signature that you would have if you did XPS and Raman measurements. And our collaborator, Dimitri Talabin at University of Chicago, did measurements on that, and we went back and forth until we had structural motives that actually resembled experiments, and this was our starting point. So once you have your starting point for a structural model, you do want to do spectroscopic characterization because you're interested in the interaction of the system with light. You also want to do structural characterization in many instances because this is what help, uh, helps you doing uh, uh, experimental validation. And over the years, uh, we have developed techniques uh, based on uh, uh, always density functional theory and going to many body perturbation theory to do spectroscopy on complex systems. So we have been worried about accuracy, but also about efficiency, because the system that we look at contain many atoms, and uh, uh, many from the point of view of first principle calculation, hundreds of atoms. And I'm not going to tell you uh, uh, the specifics, uh, but let me tell you just the general idea of what we have done. So we do first principle molecular dynamics, and then we do spectroscopy on MD samples. For example, suppose that you want to know band alignment, and I, I will get to that in a minute, between electrodes and water. What you need to know are position of energy level that you would get experimentally by doing photoemission experiment. And you can get those by doing what we call GW calculation. GW is not an acronym. G is Green's function, and W is screen coulomb interaction. And starting from DFT using many body perturbation theory. And uh, uh, in many other instances, you are actually interested in neutral excitation, those related, for example, to uh, uh, mm, optical properties, uh, because you absorb light and you want to understand what happens when you create electron hole pairs. And for this, we solve the beta salpeter equation to actually compute spectra. And we have done a lot of work in the last uh, 10 years or so to both uh, have uh, a development uh, in terms of theory and also codes. And let me just tell you that uh, these, what sometimes are called post-DFT theory, have been really key to understand the properties of system and especially band alignment for and, and optical excitation. And having verified, validated, and optimized codes is critical for uh, successful prediction. So uh, in our work, uh, uh, we uh, develop uh, codes, and uh, one code that we have developed over the years uh, is the West code to do GW calculation, uh, which is interfaced with the uh, uh, quantum espresso and the first principle molecular dynamics code QBOX. And we develop within the center also the first principle molecular dynamics QBOX, and we use uh, a, a extensively for a lot of our calculation also uh, quantum espresso. One thing that I would like to uh, uh, point out and that uh, is very important is uh, being able to couple codes and also to couple codes uh, uh, in what I called, uh, what I would like to call in vivo coupling ma mainly so that they can uh, work together at runtime. And for that, we developed client server interfaces not only to couple the codes that you see here, but also advanced sampling codes that are developed within our center and, and within the suite of codes called the SAGES to do and to look at. Uh, advanced sampling and uh, uh, rare events. And we have used exactly the same uh, technique to couple the codes with IPI, which is uh, developed in uh, Michele Ceriotti's group. 
Okay, so hopefully this uh, gives you an idea of what we do starting from first principle molecular dynamics, doing spectroscopy and coupling codes. And if you have questions on all the details uh, of, of, of this strategy, of course, I'd be happy to answer questions. And now let me tell you what is it that we are able to understand with all these uh, uh, techniques. Okay, so the first, uh, and I'm just keeping an eye on uh, the uh, uh, watch here. So first problem, general problem, absorb light to trigger chemical reactions. So uh, uh, in principle, it's a very simple problem. So we want to absorb light in a material, what we call an absorber which may be interfaced and actually oftentimes is with the catalyst and uh, other uh, uh, solid and with water. We absorb light in the absorber, we create electron hole pairs, and then we, we want the electron hole pairs to go the interface uh, being transported to water, and we want to harvest the charges for a chemical reaction. So, um, what we are facing are materials like the one shown at the bottom of this slide, meaning defective materials with very complex solid-liquid interfaces. And this is the difficulty, really, uh, uh, of the whole business. To attack this problem, we need to do simulations and prediction of a number of properties. First of all, we need a reasonable model of water or salty water, and even as of today, after many years and the efforts of many, many people, uh, including our group, we have a kind of decent model of water from first principle, but uh, not a great one. So we need to be careful about that, and we can discuss more. Once you put to the, uh, your system water, in uh, contact with the, a, a, an oxide and you understand the structural property of the interfaces, you want to compute band offset. The alignment of the valence and conduction band with the redox potentials of water to uh, answer the question, are the level well positioned so that the charges can be transferred to water from the oxide? And then if the oxide is uh, interface uh, with the catalyst, uh, you need to understand uh, what is uh, the contact between the catalyst, which is often a metal, and the semiconductor, your oxide or insulator. Do we have Schottky barriers or ohmic contact? And why do we worry about that? Because this will tell you whether the charges have a probability of recombining at the interfaces or they go through. Once we understand that, we need to understand how the charges are uh, transferred from the oxide to the water, so charge transport and interfaces. And recently, we also tried to do not only simulation and perturbatively, but also simulation uh, to look at electrochemistry now problems uh, in the presence of an electric field directly. And we have just published a paper on that. I will not. Uh, um, go into that today, but this is what we are able to do for reasonable samples. So the very first problem that we address is the problem of band offsets. And here I would like to uh, um, uh, emphasize that we are using really methods that have been used in condensed matter physics for many, many years you know, and uh, to look at the band offset between two solids, and we are using them just in a more complex situation where there is a liquid and where the structure of the interfaces, of course, is difficult to determine. Okay, so what do we do? First, we need to understand the absolute position of the valence and conduction band of water meaning we need to know the electron affinity and the onset of photoelectron spectra. Why do we want to know that? Because this allows us to understand the redox potential of water, these two levels here, that then we will align with the band of the photoabsorber. Um, and once we have this, we can compute band offset and try to understand the quality of the system that we have for the process that we are interested in. 
And uh, every time that I uh, quote people and references down here, I try to highlight in red all the junior people that uh, uh, contributed to all of our papers. So we computed the electron affinity of water. We computed photoelectron spectra, and the onset tells you the position of the valence band. Um, this has been uh, uh, quite, uh, you know, a task to compute these two quantities. And let me tell you what we have learned. So this is a work that we have done in collaboration with uh, Francesco Paisani, and uh, we ended up computing the electron affinity of water, uh, not just by doing a, a straightforward first principle MD, but using the potential that Francesco has developed, which is called MBPOL, and doing simulation also with passing. But instead of telling you exactly about the numbers and what we uh, uh, you know, obtain, here I want to make a point that the electron affinity of water experimentally is not yet settled. That number is not yet settled. The electron affinity has never been measured directly, and there are only estimates. So we are working with the comparison with estimates uh, uh, carried out experimentally and not with real numbers. This is important, very important to understand, because there are many instances in this complicated fields where um, there are numbers that you see in the literature as measurements, but these actually are estimates. And uh, so we have a, a computational number for the electron affinity, which is consistent with the best estimate that we have experimentally. Situation is different uh, for the onset of the photoelectron spectra. What I'm showing here is a photoelectron spectra, show, uh, excuse me, shown on an absolute scale. This is actually our important accomplishment. These spectra are not shifted. They are computed on an absolute scale, and they are computed on an absolute scale because we could actually do a, a, a simulation also of the surface uh, of water. And they are compared with experiment. And uh, there is a salt in water because uh, also experimentally there are uh, uh, often salts. And uh, the agreement with the experiment, uh, and the experiments were done by mm, Bernd Winter and Robert Seidel in Berlin, uh, is actually very good. And to get this kind of agreement, we had to do simulation with the hybrid functional. And then on top of this, we did GW calculations. Then we ask another question. And uh, the question is, OK, suppose that there are a lot of other salts and a lot of other anions. Here they are listed here. And uh, we could not do the simulation uh, with the, uh, all the GW simulation, uh, spectroscopy, and so on and so forth. And we did the density functional theory calculation with range separated hybrid. And you see the level, the level, the top of the valence band, the one that determines the redox of water, comp the comparison between theory and experiment is not too bad. Actually, it's quite good. Uh, if uh, you know, in some cases, you can live with the uh, errors that are of the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.5, or EV. So, you know, in some cases, the errors are smaller, but they are qualitatively good, not quantitatively excellent. That's uh, OK. So now we have uh, these levels from a theoretical point of view. And then we can do a calculation of our interface, use our favorite method to uh, do uh, the calcu calculate the levels at the interface, and we can align them with water, and we can understand what, what happens. So now let me show you three examples. One about silicon surfaces, uh, which have been used with certain functionalization as photocathodes in photoelectrochemical cells. And two, about tungsten oxide and bismuth vanadate, which have been used uh, as a photoanode in uh, mm, uh, uh, photoelectrochemical cells. And let me tell you what we learned, OK? So when you do this calculation, you can do not only band alignment, but really understand what is the uh, charge density at the interface and what happens uh, if there is a charge uh, uh, density uh, transfer. So what we learned are two things. 
for silicon that explicit solvation effects are essential to predict band offsets. Even for hydrophobic surfaces, and this is why I'm showing this charge transfer, which is small but important. Even for hydrophobic surfaces, the presence of explicit solvent gives you a, 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 changing, a, a change in the bands around the 0 0.5 EV. So it's very important. And the other thing that we learned that was already apparent actually from certain experimental results, but we could actually quantify it, is that surface functionalization, and we did calculation for hydrogenated, methyl terminated, and COH terminated surfaces, surface functionalization can be used as a knob to move the bands in a way that is desirable for the charge, for the, uh, the, the transfer of charges. So this is a, a, an important uh, uh, finding. Um, when we went to oxides, and uh, one oxide that we studied extensively, uh, uh, tungsten oxide, uh, one thing that uh, we really understood, and of course other people studied that uh, and uh, pointed out for other surfaces, like Annabella Celloni for titanium oxide, and Mike Hybertson and Marivi Fernandez Serra for uh, other oxide, like zinc oxide, is that defective surfaces are what you have you never have a completely clean surface, like in the case of silicon, for example. We, in case of silicon, it can be done experimentally, but all oxides are defective and they have oxygen vacancies. And you have to take into account these defects, otherwise you will not understand what's going on. So this is a plot of the energy levels um, uh, of uh, tungsten oxide. Uh, aligned with the redox of water, uh, valence band and conduction band uh, derived for the electron affinity that I told you. On the left-hand side, um, dotted lines, you have the results that you would get if you do calculation in vacuum and the T equals zero. Then, on the right, I plot what we got by doing calculation uh, at uh, finite temperature for solvated samples and uh, by doing defective solids. And the green line here is the, 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 the level that you have because you have oxygen vacancies in the system. So these are some results about uh, the position of the energy levels and I'm showing here. So the pink and purple are energy, are, are the measurements. And so as you see, there is a variability there too. And I'm showing the differences that you get by doing GW calculations starting from semi-local or hybrid functional. And this is uh, our comparison of the flat band potential uh, with experiment, the pink lines, uh, for oxygen deficient surfaces showing that we have something which is very reasonable. Again, nothing in this field is perfect, but it's reasonable and uh, you can uh, use it uh, to actually make physics considerations. So basically, after all the study, what we learn is the following. Because you have oxygen vacancy at the surface, you have excess charge. The excess charge at the defective surface forms a very large polarons, which in the case of tungsten oxide is a 2D polarons with the, about one nanometer radius. When we saw this, of course, we were worried that, uh, you know, we, we, this was an artifact of our calculation. We kept and this, uh, trying to have larger cell, but also we went to the bulk and we asked the question, is there really? a large polaron also in the bulk, and we did calculation with 1,000 atoms. And indeed, we also found a large polaron in the bulk, and this is consistent with EPR measurement. So because you have charge at the surface, this hints at the possible formation of a stable OH minus. When the holes that uh, you get from absorbing light is actually transferred to the water due to thermal fluctuation, then you have most likely a reactive OH group that is going to be involved in the splitting reaction. 
So this is a nice result, but note that all these results are a, um, based on calculation where the real dynamics of the holes and the election has not been dealt with yet. So we have hints of what may be happening, but it has not been dealt with uh, yet. Um, so I told you that uh, the surface is really very important. One of, uh, in the structure of the surface and uh, the defects at the surface. One of the uh, most, like, actually the most widely used of photoelectrodes is uh, these days is bismuth vanadate. And so we asked the question, can we modify the surface and uh, to actually improve uh, 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 our chemical reaction? So this is a, a long study that uh, we did uh, with uh, uh, our collaborator at Brookhaven National Lab and uh, uh, Kyung Ching Choi at uh, uh, UW Madison, in which we went through a back and forth uh, comparison of uh, our structural models. We well define experimental samples to try to really find the surface that they had, and once we, we determine the surface to understand which one is better to have a large photocurrent. So what did we do? We created different surfaces and we computed several STM images. So these are these images here on the left. Then we created different surfaces, uh, stoichiometric, vanadium ridge, bismuth ridge, and so on and so forth, and we compared with the experiment. Note that the level of theory here for these calculations for many, many surfaces is not the greatest, is not the highest, is TFT plus U. Um, why? Because we could not do so many surfaces but just do a hybrid functional. So we checked that the, 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 the trend for some, uh, uh, would be okay, and uh, uh, we established uh, with a certain number of comparisons that the trend as a functional surface termination would be okay. And then we did many calculations with DFT plus U, and we determine U by comparing again with experiment. And, um, and we found that very subtle changes in the surface composition can result in a considerable difference in photocurrent. And if there are experts in the audience, we determine that bismuth-rich surfaces increase the photocurrent. And in this work that just appeared last month with our experimental collaborator, we actually try to explain all the back and forth and the procedure that we used to understand these surfaces and the integration of our work uh, with experiment. All right, so once you have the surface, you know your surface, you want to know char transport. Char transport occurs via polarons. There are uh, 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 charges that are localized uh, due to the interaction with, with the ions. I already showed you an example in uh, with tanks and oxide. For bismuth vanadate, actually, we have small polarons. They are not, they are very much more localized than uh, in the, uh, in tanks and oxide. So what did we do here? Here, to understand, uh, actually, the char transport, we cannot do this uh, just by doing straightforward uh, simulation. So we did uh, constraint DFT, uh, calculation uh, by adapting Marcus theory in, in, in the solid state, and we try to understand how polaron hops, and looking at uh, the relative uh, 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 hopping probability of, of the polaron. And uh, um, let me skip these details. One important thing that we understood is there are very important differences in polaron hoppings in the bulk and at the surface. You need to know what happens in the bulk because this is what happens when the light is first absorbed, right? It's absorbed in the bulk. But then you cannot just use what you know uh, and you have learned for the bulk to understand what happens when the charges are uh, given from the solid to water because the polarons and how they hop at the interface is really different. And so this is what we did in these two works. Uh, 
uh, with uh, uh, Ho Sang and, and Wen Yi Wang, and we compared and we understood the difference between surfaces. And actually, the polarons, once they get to the surface, <laughs> unfortunately, actually, they are uh, 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 less favorable for charge transport than in the bulk, but uh, they, 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 the process can still, uh, to some extent, occur. So now that we have the photo absorber, we want to put the catalyst. The catalyst is this uh, iron uh, uh, oxygen hydroxide or nickel oxygen hydroxide. These are two of the catalysts that have been used, uh, are being used quite often. Unfortunately, we haven't yet put the catalyst in the photo absorber together with water, but we have studied this catalyst. And uh, um, what I'm showing here on the right are actually specific configuration of the catalyst for which we understood how to compare with the current for specific structure that were measured experimentally, and this were measured by Shannon Stahl in, uh, at UW measure, mm, Madison. So um, the point that I want to make here is that uh, by, again, comparing with experiment and, again, try to understand some qualitative, you know, structural model that we had, we understood that there are specific motives that you have to have of the bonding of iron and nickel that suggest uh, what would be responsible for a higher catalytic activity. So our work in progress is uh, to study three-way interfaces that uh, we have not yet studied for bismuth vanadate and uh, these catalysts. Uh, and uh, the reason why we want to do that is because several years ago in this work uh, uh, quoted right down here, we have looked at three-way interfaces between uh, tungsten oxide, iridium oxide, and water at that time with solvation models. But we understood that whether you have water that also touches uh, the catalyst and the oxide or not is very important, and using, uh, studying three-way interfaces is really very important. So what did we learn by doing all this? Well, first of all, we learned that the intrinsic properties of any material are totally insufficient to predict materials for water photocatalysis. You cannot ignore defects. I showed you an example of vacancies and excess electrons that are so critical to determining uh, what's going on at the interface. And if you wanted to understand, uh, I didn't show you that, but we did uh, do a study of that. If you want to understand whether you have ohmic contact or Schottky barriers between the catalyst and the photoabsorber, you need also to worry about the morphology. So the intrinsic properties of the materials are absolutely not enough. I showed you a specifically example of tungsten oxide to tell you that electronic properties at finite temperature and dynamical fluctuation are key to understand trans charge transfer mechanism. And there are several examples where properties of absorber, absorber surfaces at t equals zero may just be irrelevant for finite temperature prediction. Because again, the fluctuation and what happens at finite temperature is different, and this is very important to determining your chemical reaction. So basically, the interface is still the device, and defects are very important. And the reason why I'm saying the interface is still the device is uh, related to what uh, you know was pointed out uh, uh, for uh, uh, you know. Uh, for semiconductor heterojunction, this is Herbert Cromer Nobel lecture more than 20 years ago where he was talking about exactly band offset and not between these complicated oxide of water but between semiconductors. And, uh, but it's actually the same physical problem and he was pointing out that look, if you want to teach electrons uh, new tricks, uh, as he was putting it, really the interface is the device. So this is what uh, we need to put effort in studying and uh, understanding. OK, so this was a long story. And now I'm going to tell you a much shorter story, not because it's simpler, but <laughs> because I don't have time, on other type of oxides. 
and oxides that uh, we uh, have been interested in studying uh, to uh, uh, understand uh, uh, neuromorphic architecture. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, I mean uh, uh, the following. Uh, there are several efforts and uh, you know interest uh, by many groups in understanding if we can uh, come up with materials for energy efficient resistive switching memories, where memory and logic uh, are in you know coupled in the same system and uh, to go away from von Neumann architectures that we are in our, our normal computers. Okay, this is an incredibly complicated uh, uh, problem. Simplification, easier question. Can we find a material that has a big reaction if we apply a small stimulus? So a small, for example, uh, potential energy difference. And some of those materials are materials that have under a very, uh, uh, you know, moderate action, like a moderate electric field, can, for example, have a metal to insulator transition. This is a big response, <clears throat> a big change in the materials. And uh, so the question is, um, how do we actually exploit a metal insulator transition to realize resistive switching? And we have studied a material, again, in collaboration with experimentalists, and again, uh, 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 building on experimental work, which is lanthanum strontium cobalt oxide. And uh, the question here has been, can we induce a metal to insulator transition by changing the content of oxygen vacancy in this system, this delta here? And uh, this is a summary of the whole work. So we have looked at different phases that the material exhibit as a function of oxygen vacancies. The, num the, the name, perovskite, brown millerite, and blah, 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 are listed here, not important right now. Just to say that there are different phases that the system has depending on the oxygen and vacancy content. And uh, these different structural arrangements are associated with different magnetic and electronic properties that we have studied and uh, 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 with the three goals, understand the metal insulator transition, devise an electrical bias model to actually trigger the transition, and finally, and this we are still working on this, this difficult problem, determine the fingerprint of the oxygen stoichiometry that is so important so as to tell experimentally what is the oxygen vacancy content of a specific sample that you want to use to create your device. So now I'm just going to tell you the result of all these three studies without, of course, any details. And the results are here. First, we identify the structural transition path as a function of oxygen vacancy. And uh, we associate a structural deformation with specific electronic property and magnetic property. Again, level of theory not very high to be checked against experiments and against for some uh, 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 specific, uh, when we could afford it, the vacancy concentration hybrid functional. Uh, then, uh, we could relate the band gap opening and the metal insulator transition to the change in the magnetic order in the system. And uh, an interesting thing is that if you impose no magnetism, and there is no magnetism in the system, the band gap always closes and you don't ever have an insulator. And so we could understand what is responsible for the insulating uh, behavior. And I realize that I'm going super fast here, but I'm just giving you an idea of what we did. And once we understood that, and we were able to compute the oxygen vacancy formation energy, the electronic polarization in the system and the permanent polarization, we came up with a model with parameter completely determined by first principle to understand how to predict the electric bias to trigger the metal insulator transition. And finally, 
uh, by doing really a very integrated uh, uh, study with experiment and looking at an analysis of the uh, X-ray absorption spectra, we identify oxygen vacancy fingerprint in those spectra, and uh, uh, and then we related those uh, to measurement, experimental measurements uh, of the resistivity, uh, uh, and then to the uh, electronic property of the system. Um, so. I realized that this uh, was incredibly fast, uh, but I wanted to give you an idea that uh, uh, there are actually uh, uh, possibilities to study these very complicated materials uh, without understanding completely at the, the highest level of accuracy all the strong correlation that happens in this material and still understanding important properties uh, that are relevant for this neuromorphic architecture. Okay, so in the last two minutes, I would like to uh, just uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, some general, um, uh, you know, uh, give you some general remarks uh, that also are contained in this uh, uh, perspective that we published and I mentioned at the beginning uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, how to go about studying this very complicated system. First of all, validation is of paramount importance. Um, so if you want to have a realistic prediction, really this uh, uh, realistic prediction will only come after deriving atomic level structural model of surfaces and interfaces, not only of bulk, uh, that are validated by experiment. So we need to be careful because oftentimes especially for this complicated system, the data that we need are not out there yet. So they need to be acquired. And this is why our uh, 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 collaboration uh, on Bismuth Vanadate was successful, because the experimentalists were willing to go back to the lab and make measurements on single crystals, which is what we can simulate, and tell us, okay, this level of theory is Mm -mm, uh, decent, and we can use it for trends. If you only have, for example, thin or disordered uh, films that eventually are what ends up in the device, I understand that you will not be able to do a proper validation. And uh, I could not emphasize enough the importance of generating reference result and baseline data that we need to improve our theoretical treatment. Um, the other thing that I want, I, I didn't tell you exactly what we did with semi-local, hybrid functional, and so on and so forth, but one thing that I want to point out is that we are still at the level for this complex system where the level of theory should be chosen for the type of system and property to be investigated. We do not have a general, completely universal theory that we say, okay, we can study all oxides and all interfaces. Unfortunately, not. And sometimes a higher level of theory, <coughs> like hybrid functional, for example, may not be the thing to do, for example, if you have metals. And even I insisted on the importance of explicit solvation for certain properties, but for other were, you know, solvation model which uh, 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 um, contains specific entropic effect for other property, they may be uh, more appropriate. And uh, um, I, again, didn't show you the detail, but coupling of different theoretical approaches is almost always necessary. And a note of caution on high throughput strategies and machine learning based strategies, they may well be useful, but oftentimes, given the level of theory that we have today, if you do high throughput and machine learning just on bulk properties, this is totally insufficient. All right, so let me uh, 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 conclude. Uh, this is the very first picture of uh, uh, my group uh, in person after one year and a half that we took in Chicago on September 28th. And uh, uh, there were uh, uh, incoming grad students also. It was not only my group, and uh, specifically somebody that uh, some of you may know, uh, John Anagura, who just uh, uh, 
um, joined my group. I met him for first time on uh, uh, after an ICTP uh, seminar actually organized by Ali uh, Hassan Ali, and now Jonah is with me in Chicago. And we took a picture because we wanted to send a picture to Richard Martin with his book, and I'm sure that some of you may you know will know Richard as well. And uh, in addition to my group, and I try to uh, highlight uh, names of people in red. These are my collaborator on the left hand side on all the work on uh, uh, um, photoelectrode and catalyst, uh, Kyung Shing Soing and Dong Li and uh, uh, UW Madison and Min Zhao Liu and Chen Shu Zhu at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. Ivan Schuller and Alex Frano and uh, Yayoi Takamura at uh, San Diego and Davis are our collaborator on the EFRC. Uh, for uh, neuromorphic computation. I would also like to uh, acknowledge the uh, computer time from nat national facilities, NERSC and Argon, and also for the University of Chicago Research uh, uh, Computing Center, and we have uh, uh, quite a substantial cluster. And uh, the director of our computing center is uh, uh, Birali uh, Runesha. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude my talk and uh, uh, I'd be happy, of course, to answer any question you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Julia. So it was good to listen you now watch the talk. Um, at this point, I'll ask if there are any questions. You could just unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, sorry. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the water the splitting the splitting of the water that equation you use it you say it uh, uh h2o in in president of the the energy is give give us the hydrogen and oxygen uh, for me i did experimental uh, research on the water uh, I, I studied the, the optical properties of the water uh, as as a function of the the bacteria uh, using the high uh, voltage, uh, high voltage, for example, in that one, I couldn't control the output of. Uh, I couldn't know more much about the output. Like, is the split of the water give me uh, hydrogen and oxygen, or can give me better oxide or um, super oxide, for example, O2 minus one or minus two, for example or uh, uh, HE plus or uh, O HE minus. I couldn't explain that. So as, as, as you say that uh, you use water and catalyst, but for me, I use electro catalyst, and then we have photo catalyst. So can, can you give me a brief uh, information about this? to how to control the output of the splitting water? Okay, so um, that's a very difficult question <laughs> because I think that what you're asking is uh, uh, how uh, do I measure a photocurrent and uh, uh, what is it that uh, uh, tells me, um, you know, what is responsible for that photocurrent. So I am not an, uh, a, an experimentalist, but, sorry, but uh, um, the way the photocurrent is controlled in experiment, and actually uh, it, will, it would be difficult for me to find uh, plots, but uh, um, the question, this a question similar to yours, is exactly the question that uh, our experimentalist uh, Kyung Shing Choi with W Madison asked about how do we control the photocurrent, how do we measure it, uh, uh, and uh, depending on the surface termination, and uh, an explanation of these measurements that uh, unfortunately I, I am not able to give you in, in in real time here, is actually in this paper. So if you go to this paper, Account of Chemical Research, and also on the um, SI, uh, supplementary information of our paper in Nature Energy that came out uh, at the beginning of this year, 
you will find an explanation on how they measure exactly the photocurrent and how it is controlled. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's not an easy business, but uh, th there are techniques to control exactly and to understand uh, how to measure the photocurrent. I know it's okay. a very partial answer, but uh, I, I... Okay, okay, okay. Because, because for me, what, what, what I think about that uh, problem, because uh, I use contaminated uh, distilled water, for example, I also I, I analyze the the element of the water by using, for example, the EDX uh, seven thousand spectrometer is giving me the component of the water. I found that, for example, uh, the water is given me by, uh, for example, ninety nine point nine nine percent, and then uh, for the pure water, for example, there is a pair, for example, um, CU by 0.001%, while the contaminated water is, the, the CU is just disappear. What I think about that is because of the bacteria in, inside the water, because the water is contaminated or the, the pure water, like if, if the water like H2O is just a pure, like deionization water is not distilled ionization water. So the output uh, is become different yeah yeah okay yeah so abdallah if you take a look at this i mean we'll put the slides sorry not the slide the video online and then you can take a look at this paper or you can take a screenshot of this so that you have um this paper yeah. um any other qu other questions so, uh, sorry julia so let me ask you this question um so for instance, for water, so everybody talks about the 1.23 electron volts band gap that you need for the semiconductor for photocatalytic water splitting. And then you need to add an over potential to it. So if we take care of all the interfaces and do this MD simulations, would we be able to get the over potential? Because what NOSCOP does yeah. is to find the maximum, yeah. okay. Yes, we can, uh, in principle. Uh, I mean, uh, this, uh, so if you, if you know, so, I'm sorry, let me do this uh, differently. So, um, you, you can get, uh, so that, okay. So basically, um, if you know, uh, the uh, position of the top of the valence band of the oxide yeah. determined uh, uh, by doing the calculation of your interface yeah. uh, relative uh, to the oxidation potential of water, uh, which uh, here would be this uh, blue line, uh, thick blue line, uh, you know, uh, relative to the oxygen. If you know that, then uh, and of course you know you need so why are these uh, lines thick because uh, these are contain the fluctuation also at final temperature and also the averages that uh, in our case are not uh, you know uh, super good but um so if you know that number uh, then uh, by using nurse equation you can know the over potential and uh, and already here you kind of see that the, 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 the over potential is going to be substantial. We, this it doesn't tell you the number, but gives you an idea that this valence band is not too close to the yeah. oxygen. Uh, you can. And this is an important quantity to get, right? Because uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's what tells you whether that oxide is good or not. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions, please. Oh, uh, can I ask, Omo? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so thanks, Julia. C could you go back to that slide where you showed the correlation between the electron affinity uh, and the, for the different ions? Oh, here. Yes. Yeah. So um, just a, a curiosity. You, you know that there's this um, ranking of cations and anions, the Hofmeister series. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I just I just quickly looked at two of them, 
like the thigh of Sinai and uh, uh, where is it? I think it's the, the sulfate. And they they fall on different ends of the Anna and Hofmeister series, which is related to you know this structure making structure breaking properties uh, of water. So mm-hmm. I mean I'm just curious. It would be interesting if there was a correlation, right? Because um, these are you're talking about electronic properties here, and um, it would be interesting to see if there was a fingerprint in, in terms of uh, these these ideas of structure making with structure breaking and oh, electron yeah. affinities. Oh yeah, that. So this is a, a absolutely fantastic question, and it's a very important. Uh, problem. So um, to tell you the truth, <laughs> uh, that's what we were actually hoping to be able to find, right? So in yeah. this paper, so there is a paper here, I don't remember. Anyway, there is a paper where uh, with Alex Gaiduk when he, right. he was with me, where we tried to understand uh, whether we could, uh, with our simulation, really look at structure maker and structure breaker mm-hmm. and to understand that the structural property the bottom line is we were able to do that only for sodium chloride because of you know <laughs> just because of the difficulty of the simulation and of the length yeah, of yeah, the yeah. Yeah. okay so if uh, and then when we try to do this simulation and these so the the reason why these uh, uh, dots are also kind of thick is because you know we couldn't do simulation long enough to mm-hmm. bring down the error bars which is mm-hmm. what you would need to have a, a good handle on the structure yeah, if yeah, we could sure. do that sure. then we could have good handle on the structure we have the electronic properties better and that would be a great thing to do to get so electronic I, I, I guess i mean i guess you've already thought about this but Perhaps this uh, all this technology on the deep uh, neural network business yeah. Yeah. is the way is the way forward, right? I mean, uh... Uh, that that that's uh, a, a, again a, a good suggestion, and uh, you know, um, well, we didn't think about that that much in the sense that we are not yet able to do. Or, it, it is the way forward. It will be the yeah. The... I, I mean. If you want to get to those time scales, then that's, yeah, it, you have to do that. So yeah, it will be the. Uh, but uh, we need uh, uh, ways of. Uh, you know, the other thing that uh, I swept under the rug is, uh, and then nobody asked about is, you know, what's the concentration of this, and are you sure you have the same concentration as in experiment? Here, we did do a simulation with the same concentration as in experiment. To understand what you're saying, you also would need to vary the concentration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, 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 sure. So sure, if you sure. don't, do, you know, so so yes, it will be the, the the way to go, and we we don't know yet exactly yeah. how to go about that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. thanks for the question. So does anybody have another question? So if not, we'd like to thank um, Julia for giving us such a wonderful presentation uh, for enlightening us and teaching us about um, all the intricacies involved in um, understanding and um, photocatalytic water splitting or the behavior of catalyst um, for telling us more about the interfaces and how we should be careful about our calculations. So I think it's very good for us um, to have this talk and listen to what um, Julia is teaching us. So once again, we thank you very much, Julia. And this slide will be put online and then you could watch it and other people could watch it also. So thank you very much, Julia. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, keep in touch. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, sorry, well, Richard is going to contact you about USAFRI, US Africa Initiative. And we'll contact other people also about US Africa Initiative. Sure, sure. I, you know, again, I, I'd be very happy to be in touch.
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you. Bye, Julia. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.